Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Gloria McLennan, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Our webinar topic today is Managed Staffing Program Compliance 2021, and today's webinar is hosted by VeraClick. So we'd like to welcome everyone to our May webinar. Before we begin our webinar today, uh, just a couple of housekeeping instructions for you. These are your instructions as to how to adjust your audio during the webinar, and all attendees will be on mute throughout the webinar. Next, these are your instructions for submitting a question in the Q&A section. Please post your question at any time during the webinar. Now, I'd like to begin the webinar by introducing our featured host and guest panelists. So, our fabulous host today is Monique Bergener, who is our Senior Director, MSP and BMS Client Management at VeraClick. And our amazing guest panelist today is David Ballou, founder of Workforce MSP Guru. Welcome, David. Uh, thank you. Thank you for asking me to join. This is a, a topic that people on our team all over the world talk about every single day. So we're excited to be here. Thank you. Perfect. You know, David has a fantastic career. He's founder and CEO of an MSP Guru headquartered in London. David is a global contingent workforce and talent acquisition leader a published professional, and a very dynamic public speaker. How much more can there be, David? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can end there, that's fine. We, we, yeah, we can move on. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, no, we're going to finish this. So the, uh, the recruitment industry recognizes David for his strength in managed service provider strategy, creative thought leadership, and successful business development. Now, David, 25 years of global leadership experience, including North America, EMEA, and APAC, and working with many of the world's top logos, fantastic accomplishments. Uh, and a bachelor's degree from Regents University in London, studied law and business management in the United States, and holds very numerous amounts of staffing industry and Six Sigma certification. So welcome, David. We're Thank very you. excited to have you with us today. Thank so you. now let's begin our webinar. And Monique, I will turn it over to you to begin the discussion. Thank you so much, Gloria. I appreciate your time and welcome, David. We're thrilled to have you with us today and co-hosting. So let's, let's get started. Lots of things to talk about, but let's talk about compliance. Uh, obviously, compliance can be thought of in a variety of different areas, depending upon who you ask, and can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. So uh, you know, let's talk about that. Uh, in your opinion, if you can share some thoughts. Like like I just said a few minutes ago, you know, compliance is something that comes up literally on a daily basis for myself and members of the team. It's really, in simple terms, it's just an outcome of conforming to a rule, right? So from an MSP perspective, from an MSP program perspective, you know, we have both the external, which would be, you know, labor legislation, tax law, et cetera. And then there's also the internal MSP rules. Um, along with the KPIs, internal client policies related to background testing, um, uh, background test, drug testing, et cetera. So for, for, our, for our sake in this conversation, let, let's think in terms of MSP, uh, and I, I will bring up both throughout the conversation about the external versus the internal. But I think we're clear on, on what we're looking for, which is an outcome. Right, interesting. And, and then that'll take us into commercial cadence. Uh, what are your thoughts on that particular area? Ooh, you know, the, 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 the entire compliance um, discussion begins with the commercials, right? So from a cadence, we start off with the client MSP, Master Services Agreement, often the acronym is the, the MSA, which then feeds down to the vendor agreements uh, between the MSP and the vendor. And then those typically feed down to any employment agreements, depending on where you are in the world. Um, some countries require an employment contract, like here in the UK. Um, and then other countries do not, but ultimately the, the language would flow down. So you have this cadence of continuing to flow down from the MSA, but you know, we need to think in terms of from a MSP perspective, you know, what does that mean to me? What does that mean to us? And um, I think in terms of, for example, the 1099 independent contractor in the US, the, the IR35 contractors here in, in the UK, um, and just for the sake of those that don't understand what's going on over in this part of the world, so IR35 is just another name for off payroll working rules, right? So designed you know, to determine whether or not a contractor is in or outside the scope of IR35. Um, from a compliance perspective, 
Um, it, it started off because there was no case law, so it started off as being very fuzzy, and it had been um, heavily negotiated, heavily discussed over several years, and only recently have we now been moving to having some clarity around what IR35 actually means. Um, but from an MSP perspective, um, contractors are typically inside the IR35 rules. Um, there's, you know, it relates to the right of control, the, the ability to substitute a worker uh, or a worker substituting themselves if they can't go into work, um, you know, use of, of, of the client's equipment, computers, et cetera. Um, so the, the backbone of the compliance has become much more clear. Um, and then, you know, contractors have different types of employment contracts. Um, in the UK, we have um, contracts for employment, and then we have contract for services, two very, very different uh, types of contracts. Um, all need to be considered when you're looking at how you're going to manage your contingent workforce within an MSP, and then ultimately who is going to be left holding the bag when it comes to compliance. Correct. And, and you know, with regards to that, as we know that some, some suppliers have a, a larger volume versus others, so that compliance, the compliance factors might look different across the board as well. Yeah, you know, it's 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 always interesting to me. You know, when you look at the volume from a vendor perspective, um, you know, a vendor looks at it and says, okay, you know, what am I willing to accept for the return on my investment within this MSP and this client? And the MSP is thinking in terms of, okay, well, what are we willing? What risk are we willing to accept from a compliance perspective of our supply chain? And oftentimes, depending on the volume that the that the vendors have, the MSP may say, hey, we're willing to make some adjustments to our compliance model, our audit, our audit process, and we may be willing to accept perhaps a lower limit or type of insurance coverage um, in exchange for perhaps a higher MSP fee, program fee. So there are different ways of, of addressing it from an MSP perspective. I think it really boils down to the, the attitude or the aptitude for how much risk you're willing to accept. Some are very conservative, others are not. And it also depends on, you know, your market saturation. Where are you in the market? What are you trying to achieve? Some will assume a greater risk in order to buy the market share. So, you know, you have to take a look at from all perspectives. Um, and especially as an MSP, you need to be uh, aware, awareness factor of the vendors that are participating in your program and uh, the level of risk that they too bring to the, bring to the table. Right. All very good factors. Uh, in fact, I mean, with SLAs and KPIs, uh, you know, that's another another questionable or, you know, scenario. It, the SLAs and KPIs are clearly put in place to to measure success and performance. However, there there is supplier favoritism and so forth. So let's talk about that. You know, SLA KPIs, they're often confused. Let, let's be clear on what we're talking about. From an SLA perspective, it's what the client, the end client, they're gonna receive and what they should expect, right? And if you go back to the cadence from a vendor's perspective and the MSP, you know, it's what the vendors can expect from the from the MSP and what the MSP can expect from the from the vendors. Now, the KPIs are really, how is the SLA going to be measured? What specifically is measured? How is it measured? Um, this is often from a visual or graphic perspective, it's often a, a chart, which is color coded green, yellow and red, depending on where it is within the, the, the KPI falls within what's been agreed to in the SLA and what they should be expecting. Um, I think in our industry, the beauty of, of the VMS technologies today is the fact that much of what we're talking about here has been automated within the system. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the time, placement, timing, et cetera, um, the rate cards, the bill rate to the agreed rate card, et cetera. All of these things are now tracked in, inside the technologies. So from the SLA perspective, most of what we're talking about now is in the VMS, not really the reporting, but in the KPI analytics um, module that they provide. I, um, you know, typically these vendor KPIs are gonna be flowed on from that MSA, um, you know, and, and I would recommend, highly recommend within an MSP that that there be a comparison of performance across the vendor pool um, it, it, ghosting without names of course but i think it's important to drive recruiter performance increased better performance 
if the vendors are aware of how the competition is, is performing um, against where they are, where do they fall in that ranking? Um, I think that's very important. Absolutely. And, you know, this is where suppliers can absolutely lose tier status and so forth Ooh. or uh, recognize issues. I mean, you know, what if they're not getting feedback from the from the hiring managers so therefore they don't know how to take corrective measures? Uh, you know, that's that's a very gray area. Yeah, I, I think, Monique, from a from a I think you hit something on the head there from a from a tiered perspective, I think it's important. Um, and again, uh, not to overuse the term best practice, but I think it's important from an MSP perspective to communicate, very clearly communicate with your vendor base. You know, what does it take to move from a tier two to a tier one? And we're not saying that there has to be a guarantee. We all know that that a MSP total talent strategy, if you want to talk from a strategic perspective, we all know that that strategy is a living, breathing document. It's going to be changing depending on what's happening in the world, what's happening in the, in the labor market, um, you know, global economics, et cetera. Everything impacts the, the overall strategy. So the strategy is, like I said, living and breathing, and it does have to be able to adjust to what's happening in the world. But at the same time, you know, without pro making promises, I think it's important that vendors know what it takes to be at least considered um, to move from one tier to another. I think right, it's important right. that they know that. I do have a question for you that was uh, posed from our audience on this topic. Uh, do you see changes in the SLA and KPIs for MSP programs considering the past year and a half or so in the pandemic? Uh, and now that we're coming out of the pandemic, if yes, uh, what changes, what, what, do you, what do you think those changes might be? Um, I, I, I can talk to what I've seen um, and witnessed. So when it comes to, this is globally, mind you, when it comes to background checks and drug testing, I have seen considerable changes um, to the adjudication rules within a program, uh, especially now that people are working from home um, and that the market has opened up. Um, I think people, most companies have a different perspective on risk because of the pandemic. Um, I often, you know, HR departments were very adamant about people being in the office and that has completely changed as we're all fully aware uh, for most organizations anyway. And I think that's created a whole nother dynamic of, you know, working hours, what's expected from a productivity perspective, all of which falls under a, uh, an SLA, for example, you know, what are the expected hours of work? Well, you know, that's changed. It's it, The norm is no longer the norm, which I think is very positive, but then how does that impact the SLAs? And I think SLAs need to be um, evaluated at least on an annual basis. Um, I realize that most, uh, I should say many of the MSP organizations execute uh, an MSA typically on a three to a five year uh, contract but that doesn't mean that you can't revisit your SLAs at least on an annual basis to make sure that you're in alignment with the, with the strategy we talked about a few minutes ago. Wonderful, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, and you know, this takes us directly into audits. Um, clearly, when we're, we're, we're measuring SLAs, KPIs, and even more, you know, contractual audits, uh, you know, this is something that's a cumbersome activity. However, it's very important. Yeah, you know, when when we talk audits, and and you know we we touch many of the various MSP organizations around the world, and we have been brought in um, to perform uh, independent third party audits on MSP programs. Um, you know, I can share that we we were brought in to do a third party MSP audit uh, on a supplier implementation, the transition. It was well over 100 vendors, um, and this was a Gen 2, so second generation MSP, meaning the first generation, first MSP was no longer there, they're being replaced, a new MSP was coming in. As part of that transition, we were brought in to conduct the audit. From an insurance perspective, we uh, gathered the COIs, the certificate of insurance, and went through each, each vendor, and we had 100%, mind you, 100% non-compliant. And some of them were pretty severe, and then others were you know, very minor, but still non-compliant. And this was 100% of the audit was non-compliant. And this was coming from a, a global, very 
very well-known logo in the MSP world. So I think it's important that, you know, if, if there are MSP organizations on the phone listening, I think it's important that you go back and revisit um, the audit process to ensure that you are delivering what has been agreed with the client. Um, and typically these would be in the SLA, um, you know, policies, pricing, the program business rules, you know, what have you agreed to? And this is where so many uh, clients as well as MSPs um, end up in trouble. And oftentimes so do the vendors because they don't typically, um, in many cases anyway, from a vendor perspective, they don't always read the contract. They just want the business. And then once they find out what is required commercially, perhaps they don't have the, the employee um, capacity to support what's required. And so things get pushed down the list and things sometimes don't happen. Or you know they say, oh, we'll catch up on that later, or we'll do that next quarter. And then that next quarter never comes. So I think it's important that before, from a commercial perspective, before an MSP, before a client, before a vendor, before you sign into those, you know, before you agree to those commercials, you really need to evaluate, do you have the bandwidth from a, from a capacity perspective to support what you're signing up to? Absolutely. That's a very, very, very important factor. Uh, you know, it, speaking generally, uh, you know, program teams can run typically very lean and mean in, in regards to oversight and sometimes they don't have enough bandwidth to truly you know review everything coi's one particular point in mind you know coi's are just very very cumbersome to track whether you have an outside provider that's helping you to do such because you know different dates times and so forth um you know one company might have multiple coi's versus just simply one based on their insurance coverage and then the other thing that I wanted to mention, David, is what exceptions have you seen with regards to COIs, for example, and coverage? If you have increasing scale of coverage for, for suppliers, you know, where today they have a, a lower headcount compared to other suppliers that have a much, much higher headcount, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And what, what have you seen out in the, in the marketplace? Yeah, I a couple things, a couple notes there. Um, first off, you know the the multiple COIs, the certificate of insurances, and and the the efficient management thereof. You know, it's it, anyone who has has taken a look at, for example, in the U.S., the the Accord form, the standard form for insurance certificates, and you'll find often there's multiple carriers, uh, multiple expiration dates, et cetera. Of course, there's technology out there to manage. Um, in a very efficient way, the the COI process for vendors. Um, I, I think what's really important, and I can't stress this enough, is that the MSP who has retained these vendors, if they need to maintain these COIs even after they've expired, oftentimes um, a lawsuit will will originate, and several months have passed, and sometimes when the occurrence took place isn't covered on their current certificate. And if the COI that was in enforced, uh, was enforced during that period of time is no longer available because it's been deleted, um, because perhaps someone on the MSB team decided that it was no longer necessary because it had expired, suddenly you find yourself scrambling to figure out, okay, well, who was the carrier um, at that particular time of the incident in order to tender over that lawsuit? Um, and trust me, the, the, the insurance companies are not going to be um, as um, generous or forthcoming with that information than you're going to want them to be. So it's really important that regardless of OCOI has expired, keep them. You never know when you might need them. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. so let's talk about the types of insurance. Um, and again, it falls down to, from an MSP's perspective, it should fall down to the type of risk that you are incurring with that particular vendor. Now, I'm not even gonna go down the path of the light industrial production workers, because I think we all know the high risk, hence the high workers comp rates, et cetera. So I think that's a whole discussion for itself. But from a, say an IT vendor perspective, you may have an IT vendor who only has five, five people working, but yet you're requiring extreme types of insurance, or I should say realistic or 
um, realistic insurance coverage types, but perhaps the limits, the, the value, the dollar value that you're requiring perhaps is high. And it's what the client is requiring. But for a vendor who only has five workers, it's extremely expensive for them to go out and buy that additional coverage. Um, so I think it's important to think, okay, what can we do with this vendor? Um, first off, do we really need to retain them? And second off, if we do, or if we want to, then perhaps we need to make some level of accommodation um, when it comes to the, the uh, coverage limits. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier, it's not unusual for an MSP to charge an additional percentage point or two or half a point on the program fee to that vendor to cover the gap between what's required and what the vendor actually has. Now, again, this, this is a MSP's decision whether or not they're willing to accept that risk. Um, and at the same time, you, know, you may see vendors who self-insure for different types of limits and coverages. And in those cases, you know, the best practice is to have a letter on file from the chief financial officer of that particular vendor committing to the, the self-insured status, et cetera, and requesting the appropriate financial statements to go along with it. Um, but there are ways to work around it. I think that it's important that all parties come to the table um, and are flexible in their approach, uh, specifically to um, insurance compliance. Absolutely, I completely agree with you. And it's just such a factor, quite honestly. Uh, mm. The next topic that I'd like to just discuss with you, uh, David, is very near and dear to my heart, obviously, candidate verification. Uh, you know, we all we, we always thought about this years ago. We always experienced situations and stories where the candidate wasn't exactly who you thought you interviewed and, and brought on for your for the position. Yeah. And as time went on, we started to to call it, you know, candidate bait and switch. We started to name it, we started to identify it perhaps a little bit more frequently. However, now that we're fully or we have over this last year been fully in a, um, a remote capacity. Uh, we've experienced this in a variety of different manners. So clearly with VeraClick, we're very close to this and, and, and eliminating this factor, but I'd like to get your thoughts and interpretation on, on candidate verification and what you've seen out there. Oh, Monique, this is what brought us together in the first place. I, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and that's been a couple of years now. It, it, it's always interesting to me, um, uh, and now more than ever, really, from a serious perspective, the the candidate verification process, right? So, you know, are they who they say they are? Um, and from a well, let's talk IDs, biometrics, reference checks, skills testing, all of the above. You know, are these people who they say they are? And I can share an example. This was several years ago, and it was with an IT client. Um, and a candidate showed up for an interview. Um, and it was an in-person interview, and they, they interviewed very well. And they were offered the position. Several days later, the candidate came into the office to begin their job. Everything looked right. Everything seemed right. And uh, several days later, the, the manager just didn't feel right about it. Something wasn't clicking. Um, the skills that had been discussed during the interview, although they were, they were there, they weren't there to the level that they had engaged in conversation during the interview. And it turned out, long story short, it turned out that the candidate was an identical twin and they both worked within the IT industry. Oh my. Uh, <laughs> you know, however, one was a bit more savvy than the other. Um, and so, you know, that that's a an extreme case, but it goes to show you the importance of, of checking and, and the, the validation, um, which is something that you guys provide. Um, I think it's important that this be taken into consideration. Um, you know, when you think about it in terms of the gig economy, um, you know, forget about the, the pandemic we just went through. You know, before the pandemic ever started, we had the gig economy where these independent workers were coming and going. And you know, let's face it, most of them were in the IT world. And so the importance of having the ability to validate a and verify a candidate is extremely important. Now more than ever, to your point, I, I think it's, it's critical. Um, I, I did jot down some notes on this one. There's Deloitte did and this is pre-COVID, Deloitte had some information, although that was fantastic. 61% um, you know, were finding it difficult to source candidates, 37% difficulty in finding the right skills, 84% are hiring gig workers. Now this was before, before COVID. 
So when you're talking 84% before, imagine what it would be now. Um, mm. wow. It's just amazing to me, you know, the, the, the use of the gig economy now more than ever, which has become our norm. It is our new norm. Um, and I think it clearly opens up opportunities, not only for Vericlick, but for you know, the MSP providers, staffing firms, everybody, everybody in our industry, um, I think needs to, to sit and take a strong look at what they're doing and how are they managing the, uh, the candidate verification. It's really important. It is, it is truly. Um, you know, the stories that we can share are, are just mind boggling, but uh, that's another conversation, obviously. But thank you very much for your support in that. Um, and and we, we were privileged to to have met you as a result of Vericlick and the technology that we have, David. So, uh, but I do have a, an audience question. Uh, in your opinion, based on your high touch knowledge and expertise across industries and geographies, what do you think will be those next in-demand talent skills that could be found in the gig community? Oh, that's an, that's an, that's an easy question from my perspective. Oh. <laughs> um, and, and whenever you ask my opinion, you know, you know that you know, you'd be ready for the answer. It's going to be um, potentially it could be a long conversation. So I'll try to try to cut myself back. It's, it's AI and ML. So artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, this is where the majority of the world is going and it's going very quickly um, unfortunately although there are many suppliers who staffing suppliers who are um, doing their best to meet the demand um, unfortunately that best isn't quite enough in most situations um, most organizations that are high on the ai ml list are using direct sourcing methods um, in tandem with their supply chain. Uh, the, the supply chain, as we know it historically, has changed. Um, and you know, AI and ML is is the wave of the future. Um, you know, it, we started out in the IT world as India being the hotbed of, of you know outsourcing projects and, and and sourcing of talent and bringing talent from India into various countries, including the United States. Uh, and then that began to change over time and Soon it became Eastern Europe. Uh, you had people coming in, consultants coming in from Poland and Romania and other places. Um, and now from an AI ML perspective, funny enough, um, Africa seems to be a hotbed of, of uh, talent specifically for this particular industry. Um, there are organizations that, you know, obviously are specializing, highly specialized in AI and ML. Um, and I think that any staffing vendor who makes it or isn't making it part of their strategy needs to do so. Interesting. You know, I, and I have one other question with regards to, if I may, candidate verification. Uh, do you feel that there will be even more advanced technology development solution required? I do. Um, and that's where so? I believe. I, I do. And I think that's where the AI and the ML is going to come in. Okay. Um, I, I think that some of, you know, historically what we've done is already antiquated um, without getting into too much detail. I think that where the industry is going, very much like the financial and banking industry, um, the various checks, even today, you know, with your online banking, see how that has changed just in the last year or two, maybe not even that long ago, things have changed considerably. Um, so I do think it will continue to evolve. Um, I, I think blockchain um, is another hot topic. Uh, and I look forward to the day when we can conduct business uh, within a blockchain environment where we're not having to you know, create multiple documents. You can simply give someone access to your particular block uh, of information and you control your data. Um, you know, not necessarily having Google or somebody else having control of your data, but you control your data. Um, and I think that is probably, although it is hot, I think it's not as hot as the AI and the ML, but I think it's it's quickly moving in that direction. Um, I think our industry is behind the eight ball when it comes to, to blockchain. There are some who are actively involved, um, but I think we're, we as an industry are, are behind the eight ball when it comes to, to the blockchain. Right, right. 
Interesting. And, and with regards to, I mean, you touched on a couple of uh, points, uh, David, with regards to artificial intelligence and machine learning, obviously, you know, there are a lot of buzzwords that are surrounding this and so forth, direct sourcing. Um, you know, I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that with you. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it, buzzwords tend to drive me drive me a bit batty there, but, <laughs> but, from, but from a, and I agree with you, they tend to be, you know, overly used, unfortunately. Um, but I do think um, our industry, um, when I say our industry, the recruitment industry as a whole, not just specifically the MSP world, but recruitment as a whole, I think we really need to seriously take a look at the direct sourcing opportunities that are available, the tools and technologies that are available uh, to support that process. Um, and if I were in a ownership position of a staffing firm, I would be giving serious investment consideration into direct sourcing tools. Um, just from an efficiency perspective, um, you know, speed to fill is becoming more and more and more uh, of an urgency, um, not just to fill, but obviously to source and identify, qualify, and then fill the position. And so from a, uh, flipping back again to the KPIs and the SLAs, this is all connected. You know, again, another buzzword, ecosystem, but it's all connected. Right. Um, you know, and I'm aware that there are MSPs that are using direct sourcing for clients. Um, some vendors are not aware that that's happening. Um, and so, you know, they, they believe that, oh, I'm a tier one. Well, you are, um, but you might also be competing with a, a direct sourcing tool that's being used to create pools of qualified candidates that quite frankly come in at a, a lesser rate because they don't have the, the margin of an MS or of a vendor uh, staffing firm. So right, right. Not ju it's not just about efficiencies, it's also about cost, cost and pricing. Um, it's really important. You know, when you think about it, there's there's over 750 job boards around the world. I mean, it, it's wow. ridiculous. Yeah, it is, it's ridiculous when you think about it. That's a lot and of job boards. <laughs> yeah, you know, and there's microsites, there's social media. I mean, there's all these different ways now of going about sourcing candidates. So if you're going to think about efficiencies, you're gonna have to somehow wrap your head around that and your hands and your budget to say, okay, what can we do better? And oftentimes it's gonna be via technology. So, you know, I've had conversations with staffing firms to say, hey, you know, we can come in and do an optimization project for you, which we do. And we find out, oh, well, we can reduce the, the steps in a, in a onboarding process by 50%. And that's not unusual, by the way. Um, and oh, by the way, we can save you X. And typically X is equal to at least one FTE. Hmm. So, and it's a lot less to have the technology than it is to keep the people. Now, I'm not saying people aren't important. They are. Uh, we're in the people business. But at the same time, we need to somehow together come up with a balance somewhere in the middle of what does that balance look like? And it's going to be different for every company. Right, right. And, you know, direct sourcing absolutely is, you know, I say it's a, it's a big, it's a buzzword out there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and we've been talking about direct sourcing for about a year or so. And, you know, we're, we're Vericlick has Verisource, a direct sourcing technology that integrates. However, uh, so I'm very well versed on it. But with all due respect, Direct sourcing is still a, a bit ambiguous. Uh, it might mean different things to different people because it really has not yet been fully and clearly defined across the board, in my opinion. Uh, have you have you found that to be the same? Uh, I have, depending on who you ask within the, the chain of our industry, right? So clients, they view it as, ah, it's, it's a less expensive way of sourcing candidates and it's faster. MSPs view it as it's less vendors we need to work with, and it's great for our KPIs because our placement timing, you know, goes down considerably because we identify the candidates faster, um, and our KPI for customer satisfaction goes up, and so if the client satisfaction is up, we're in a good spot. So the MSPs have have welcomed it. Now the vendors, this is this is where it gets a bit tricky because, you know, especially when a program is considered to be vendor neutral. I think I think at the point where direct sourcing has become part of that MSP model, uh, vendor neutrality, conflict-free, whatever the words you choose to use, I think that the direct sourcing um, changes the game uh, of what 
the vendor neutrality or conflict free actually means um, because vendors are no longer being considered um, uh, equal, especially mm -hmm. with the direct sourcing advantage. It's an advantage, right? Um, not sure I answered your question on that one. If you could repeat it, maybe I'll give you a little bit more information. No, absolutely. And 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 I'd like to. Uh, I do have a, a question though about direct sourcing. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is the next evolution of direct sourcing? Uh, and then would you would those evolution changes be for the same be the same for North American as well as global programs? Um, <clears throat> well. Um, I think it's a technology that is evolving um, at, at a very significant uh, speed. Um, if, you, if you compare it to the VMS world, you know, the VMS world, I can remember when VMS first came out and we were talking 20, 20 plus years ago. Um, right. Mm -hmm. and, and there really wasn't a lot of innovation or change within the industry until maybe the last I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on a limb here. Five to eight years, maybe. Um, I think many of the of the systems remain the same. They pretty much uh, delivered the rec to check process. There were some minor differentiators when it came to uh, reporting and analytics, uh, but for the most part, um, the rec to check process is what it is, uh, and it follows a very um, standardized, if you want to call it, work stream. Direct sourcing, I think, is uh it's still infancy in my perspective but the like i said the velocity of change is happening much faster so i see direct sourcing ultimately uh becoming the predominant and staffing vendors if they're not highly specialized um, generalist firms will most likely fall by the wayside unless they can reinvent themselves I think that direct, direct sourcing is going to take the lead in our industry. Um, and I think that candidates are welcoming the opportunity to engage with these platforms. It's how they already engage with friends and people and family. Um, you know, people rarely, unfortunately, don't talk much. They, they text um, right. <laughs> you know, or they like. Um, so it's, it's a bit different. It's a different world, but, you know, we need to we need to change with it. And I do think that direct sourcing will become the predominant um, method of sourcing candidates. And like I said, staffing firms will slowly, um, if they're generalists, will fade. And those that are savvy will very quickly begin to change their, their, their brand to become a bit more strategic um, and become highly specialized, for example, in AI or ML or something along those lines. Interesting. I, I think that's a, an exceptionally valid point, David. Uh, I do have another question for you. If vendor neutral programs were to come to an end, what would mm -hmm. happen with the supplier base? And, and how would programs be uh, re-engineered to address this change? I, I, great question. Um, but I think the reality, the reality is most staffing firms who are participating in vendor neutral programs if if they are behind closed doors would share a story and say uh, a storyline of i'm not so sure i truly believe in the concept now i believe because of the changes in the vms analytics that the data now more than ever can support whether or not a program is truly going to be or is operating in a vendor neutral fashion. Um, but at the end of the day, there is direct sourcing that's happening um, where, from a different perspective, direct marketing, I should say, it's a better term for that. Vendors okay. are going in and, and you know, marketing candidates directly to, whether they want to admit it or not, are, are direct marketing their candidates. And so things, people are going around the process. And it's rare to find an MSP organization where there isn't that leakage of uh, procurement of sources, sourcing going around the process, whether it's through contingent going through SOW on a purchase order, there's lots of different ways to position it, but it's happening. Now, the beauty of the VMS systems is that now using SOW and contingent in a single system, we can begin to push that out, create the visibility we need, 
and then put some corrective actions in place to stop that from happening. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Yeah. I mean, some, sometimes yeah. you don't get what you need through a program, you know, unfortunately, and others where you don't feel the need to because the program does give you everything you need. So again, every program is run and managed differently. So you know, the suppliers, sometimes, I mean, sometimes they have relationships with the hiring managers. So how, how do they stop that? Um, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's yeah, that that's another very large conversation that, that could, we could go on about, but um, it's interesting, very, very much so. So thank you for that. Uh, well, if I could just add one more thing to that topic, yeah. you know, from, from a vendor neutrality perspective, I, I think if you put all your cards on the table and you're a staffing firm, it's similar to managing a business. If you manage your business well and you take very good care of your employees first and your clients second, um, the statistics, the metrics take care of themselves. And I think it's very similar in the MSP where when it comes to a vendor performance. So therefore, you know, logic holds that if a vendor is performing well and they're doing everything correctly, is vendor neutrality that important? I'm not so sure that it is. I'm not so sure. Hmm. Interesting. So. Interesting. So in closing, I'd like to talk about uh, tech innovation. Uh, you know, there's there's so much technology out there and, and it's ever evolving. But with regards to VMS, ATS, direct sourcing systems, apps and so forth, you know, local to global, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, wow. You know, what is innovation um, is doing something better and different, um, not the same thing over and over and over and over again um, and repackaging. It's funny, I had a conversation not that long ago with somebody about VMS systems and and some of the people on this call might think back and remember the old catalog days. When wow. VMS is, yeah, when VMS is first came out, there was what we called a catalog, a catalog of contingent workers. Now, the downside was you had to maintain the catalog. So very quickly, because lack of resources and capacity, very quickly, the, the catalog which started out as a great idea, but it wasn't maintained well enough. And then suddenly it really wasn't a great idea because the, the, the candidates weren't updated when they needed to be. Now we have systems that uh, allow candidates to update their own information on a regular basis. And systems go out and remind them to keep their data updated. So I think from an innovation perspective, things are and have changed. Now, the workforce has also changed along with it. So, you know, thanks to Facebook and Amazon and all the rest of it, um, people who are using apps and technology are looking for ways to oftentimes, unfortunately, avoid conversation, but the ability to respond 24 seven and say, yes, I'm interested, no, I'm not. Um, we have a client in Dublin that is a staffing firm and their recruiters make no um, phone calls out or emails out to potential candidates. Everything is is done electronically, digitally. And really? yes, and when the recruiters show up in the morning, they sit down at their desk at their calendar and it's completely booked, but it's booked with candidates who were made aware of the position. They are interested in the position, so they are at least a warm lead, if not a hot lead. And the candidate made the decision to book a time on the calendar of that particular recruiter to have a conversation about the position. So think about from a timing and a uh, optimization of time, best use of time, whatever label you choose to throw at it. Um, you know, so recruiters aren't sitting around anymore making phone calls. Oh, are you interested in this position? Wasting 10 minutes and getting a call back saying, no, I'm not interested or no call back at all for that matter. So right. I think from a tech innovation perspective, technology is, again, it's going to be leading, leading the way AI, ML is going to make it even better. Um, and eventually we will be in a position where that direct sourcing tool that we're using, taking into consideration the use of AI and ML um, will not eliminate 100%, but I think it will eliminate a good at least 80% or more of what's required of people in our industry today. I think that's where we're heading quickly, very quickly. 
Absolutely. And, and the technology is obviously very important, David, as you mentioned, and it's been utilized in a variety of different new and innovative ways lately. Um, however, uh, where technology has been easily adapted and re very well received by many, mm -hmm. there are still some that likes like the standard old fashioned, if you'd like to say, way of communication, even if that means a phone call, an email, uh, to be able to follow up and have a conversation. Not everybody wants that text. Sometimes they're spam filters and they may not even ever get the the information. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I think the market, the candidate market is um, and continues to mature um uh, now more than ever um and i think you know i mentioned blockchain earlier i think that there are many candidates now that want to own their data they want to be in control of who sees what and who's aware of what so i think from a technology perspective yes we have multiple tech providers delivering different types of solutions within our world recruitment world um there are integrations which we haven't talked about um there are many different factors within integrations. You know, are they push, are they pull, are they both? What do they do? How simple are they? Do they actually work? Um, there are questions that have to be asked when you're talking about integrations of systems with one another. But many of the new direct sourcing tools, they do have those integrations readily available. They're already integrated with, with um, um, Job Diva and the rest of the ATS is out there, mm -hmm. and et cetera. Um, and so I think some of that learning curve has been significantly minimized I, I think I think we have to give candidates more credit than maybe historically we've given them um, and of course you know there will be those that prefer to have those conversations um, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that but I think they will be the exception to the rule moving forward interesting absolutely interesting well David I I want to Thank you so much for your time and and your 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 you know your conversation today. This has been eye opening, enlightening. It's just been fabulous to to talk about what we're so passionate about with you. And and I thank you very much for that. Um, with that, I will hand it back over to Gloria. And thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monique, and thank you, David. You know. Just a really, really excellent discussion to echo, Monique. You know, informative, enlightening. Uh, I think it's one of the main reasons we call you the MSP guru, David. So <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your experience and your expertise with our team and our attendees. Uh, and a, really a sincere thank you and special thank you to Monique, who is our amazing host today. She really, you know, guiding us through this discussion. And again, a really special thank you to you, David Balu, for your uh, time and um, you know in interest and in information on, on behalf of Veraclick as well as our audience. So I hope everyone out there enjoyed today's topic and discussion, and we thank you for attending and participating today. Uh, all of our attendees will receive a survey at the conclusion of the webinar, and also we would appreciate if you could just take a few minutes and provide us with your valuable feedback. We would really appreciate that. So again, a special thank you to all of you for joining us today for this webinar. My name is Gloria McLennan, and on behalf of VeraClick and our guest today, David Ballou, have a great day.